Praise be Jesus and Mary. Today's first reading comes from the book of Exodus and explains the Ten Commandments, right? God revealing the Ten Commandments to us. And this is really something that can be known by the light of human reason, just natural reason. This is the natural law, okay? Pretty much common sense. And the observance of the Ten Commandments are very, very important because it's necessary for salvation, right? To be saved, we need faith and works, okay? Not faith alone, but faith and works, right? Faith in our Savior, Jesus Christ, and works, at a bare minimum, the observance of the Ten Commandments. That's faith puts us in the state of grace, right? When we receive baptism and we profess the faith of the church or our parents profess it on our behalf. And then to maintain that state of grace in our soul, we need to observe the Ten Commandments. Avoid serious mortal sin. That's why when the good young man goes up to Jesus and asks, Good Master, what must I do to enter the kingdom, to have eternal life? And our Lord said, If you would enter into life, keep the commandments, right? Avoid mortal sin. Keep God's grace in your soul. So here we see the importance of the Ten Commandments. But we also know that the love of God, okay, the bare minimum love of God consists in this. This is what St. John tells us in his first letter. He says, the love of God consists in this, that we keep his commandments. Right? So those who keep the commandments, those who avoid mortal sin, keep the love of God in its minimum degree, okay, in the soul. Now, that love of God, of course, is meant to grow, okay, and should increase from day to day throughout our lives. That's the process of sanctification, all right? And we do that by practicing the virtues and doing good works, which aren't strictly obligatory, but which we're inspired to do by the Holy Spirit. All right, so the commandments are very important, and there's a wonderful commentary on the state of affairs, the situation currently in the United States with regard to the Ten Commandments. There's a scripture scholar named John Bergsma, and on his website, he makes this interesting observation. It is amazing how countercultural and politically incorrect the Ten Commandments have become in the developed West. We have the new atheists insisting there is no God, while the rest of culture makes idols of money, sport, celebrities, sexuality, drugs, etc. Right? That's the first commandment. If God's name is mentioned in public, it's usually in an act of profanity. Second commandment. And there's not even a remnant of the old practice of closing shops and canceling events to give people one day off a week to worship. That's the third commandment. He skips over the fourth commandment, goes to the fifth. Killing is popular and legal in the form of abortion and euthanasia and glamorized on television. Dan Savage and other media personalities are telling us that adultery is good for society. Sixth commandment. The government steals from the public via unfair taxation, and the public steals back with fraudulent tax returns. Politicians, scientists, and journalists routinely fabricate, twist, distort, manipulate the facts, all various forms of lying. Eighth Commandment. And public advertising is based on arousing people's lust and greed. Ninth and Tenth Commandments. 
We have a society based on the violation of the Ten Commandments, okay? That is the awful, tragic state of affairs in which we live. Right? Now, what does that mean? That means we live in a society that does not love God, right? The love of God consists in this, that we observe his commandments. We have a society that is completely rejected love of God. And as I mentioned, these are necessary for salvation. So we have a society which has paved the path, okay, towards eternal damnation, okay? If we live in society and go with the flow, that's where you go. Now remember the prayer of Our Lady of Fatima that she asked us to pray at the end of each decade of the rosary. Oh my Jesus, forgive us our sins. Save us from the fires of hell, especially those in most need of thy mercy. We need to say that prayer with America and Americans particularly in mind because of this, because of the society in which we live, which has completely rejected the Ten Commandments. Now, for souls who love God, the commandments bring joy, right? For those who don't love God or have a minimal love for God, that soul will find the commandments burdensome, and they'll be tempted to think they're unfair and they need to be done away with, right? But for those who love God, the commandments are joy. They reveal to us his will, how to please him, and really the true road to happiness. This is what the responsorial psalm sings today. The law of the Lord is perfect, refreshing the soul. The decree of the Lord is trustworthy, giving wisdom to the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The command of the Lord is clear, enlightening the eye. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The ordinances of the Lord are true, all of them just. They are more precious than gold, than a heap of purest gold, sweeter also than syrup or honey from the comb. So now we can see where we are in our spiritual life, okay, whether we are um, making slow progress or whether we're more advanced based on our reaction to the Ten Commandments. Do we find them burdensome, troublesome, annoying, or do we love them and embrace them like the psalmist sings, all right? And so we need to examine ourselves and we need to pray and strive to make progress in the love of God. That's the road to true happiness. Now we go to the gospel and our Lord enters the temple, all right? This is the second time he would enter the temple, the first time St. John recalls in the second chapter of his gospel. This is the second time, or no, rather this is, yeah, this is the second time, this is the second chapter of St. John. Okay, since the Passover of the Jews was near, our Lord goes up to Jerusalem. He finds them in the temple area, those who sold ox and sheep and doves, as well as the money changers seated there. And what did he do? He made a whip out of cords and drove them all out of the temple area with the sheep and oxen and spilled the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. And those who sold doves, he said, take these out of here and stop making my house, my father's house, a marketplace. Now, in reading this passage, it kind of goes against how we customarily think of Jesus, right? The good and gentle Jesus. And I think there are some out there who are tempted to accuse our Lord of a fault here, right? They want to reduce our, well, you see, Jesus was, was human too. 
he lost his temper, you know, and kind of lost control. Okay. Don't fall into that, okay? Remember who Jesus Christ is. He is the Son of God, the second person of the Blessed Trinity who has taken on a human nature, okay? And as such, he is perfect, infallible, and impeccable. He is not capable of sinning, nor of the least imperfection. Okay? So what does that mean? It means that there was no fault. There was no imperfection performed in this action. It was just indignation. It was the passion of anger used according to right reason for the present circumstances at hand. Okay? So that was perfect virtue. Okay? Just indignation combined with zeal for the honor of God. Okay? And so our Lord made a whip out of cords and drove them all out. And as one theologian said, when our Lord swung that whip, do you think he ever missed? No. Okay, he was right on the money. And he knew, I mean, think about Padre Pio, right? Another man, saint, okay? Moved, inspired by the Holy Spirit, but not always gentle with everyone. He knew which penitents needed harsh words, okay? And gruff treatment. You know, not out of, done out of a spirit of vengeance, but motivated ultimately by love for God and love for souls to bring them to true repentance. Okay? Also, out of zeal and honor for defending the sacrament, right? Didn't want to violate the sacrament or commit a sacrilege by giving absolution to someone who was not disposed. Right? And so, again, Saintliness, virtue is not silliness, but always according to right reason. And so our Lord commands them to leave, and the, his disciples recalled the words of Scripture, zeal for your house will consume me. Now what does this mean for us spiritually? All right, our Lord comes into the temple and cleanses it. We need to remember that our bodies are also God's temple, right? We are the temple of the Holy Spirit. There is the indwelling of the Most Holy Trinity in the soul and the state of grace. Right? The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit dwell in that soul okay, as a friend, as if it were their own home. And so our Lord has zeal for this temple as well. And he wants to cleanse it, that is, to rid it of sins and vices. And so we want to become saints, I hope. But remember this. Our Lord wants us to become saints more than we do. The zeal for the house of God consumes him. He is consumed. His sacred heart is burning with the flame of divine love and the zeal to make our hearts burn with love for God as well, and that our souls would be pure and immaculate like his mother's. And so if we do our small part, right, let's observe the commandments, let's pray, let's receive the sacraments, and practice mortification. If we do these things, then our Lord will do the rest. He will cleanse us of vices and sins and imperfections and make our souls worthy dwelling places for God. And so, let's resolve to make a good confession this Lent. Right? That's, practically speaking, where our Lord cleanses this temple, is in the confessional. That's where we can acquire the graces to grow in love for God, so that the commandments won't be a burden, but they will become easy and delight and joyful. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.